Scripture is going to be Luke chapter um, 1, I'm sorry, chapter 22, verses um, 1 through 62. So, let's try to read this. Now, the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished, prepared it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be the regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table, or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded that, you might, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. You are those who have stayed with me. Oh, no, no, repeat that. Oh, no. Yeah, let me just find where I need to go. Okay. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or a knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. 
and he said to them, It is enough. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw that what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched the ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him to the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man was also with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. In the scriptures, we see two people weeping at this time. Judas wept and killed himself. Peter wept in repentance. And he gets up to lead the disciples. Here's our message map for today. I'm not trying to be flip here, but we're going to do the ABCs of all the, of these six topics. Today's message is titled, Jesus is Governed by God's Will at Gethsemane. We're going to look at six different topics. Number one, we're going to look how the disciples took an account and a comparison of who is the greatest. Isn't that interesting? On a night when the Lord is saying terrible things are about to happen, and they're worried about, wait, am I first? Am I going to be second? Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We're like children, aren't we? Uh, number two, we're going to see how Judas jumped ship. We're going to see the pair, the P-A-R-E, the politically appointed religious establishment who opposed Christ. We're going to see the ABCs of the politically appointed religious establishment who opposed Christ. We're going to see Peter, who asserts his loyalty, bombs out three times, and, and, and during the resurrection story, we see that he has an amazing comeback. And then we're going to see Christ in Gethsemane, who says, not my will, but God's be done. And what does all this do for us? Why did God put his son through this? God took him who knew no sin and made him sin for us. Number six, God's provision of the crucifixion makes it possible for us to walk with God. The Bible says in Habakkuk that the Lord's eyes are too holy to look on sin. 
So how can God have fellowship with us? He laid our sins on Christ on the cross, and he imputed to us the righteousness of Christ. When he looks at you, wayward as we are, he sees the, the sacrifice and the blood of his son covering us, and we are redeemed. He sees us as redeemed holy people. I know we don't deserve it, but that's what the Bible says. And if you don't believe what the Bible says, if Peter did not believe what Jesus said, he could not bounce back from this tremendous failure. We have to believe, take God at his word. I have saved you. I have paid the price. I have redeemed you. I am here to comfort you. I am here to build you up. You can do what I'm calling you to do. Anyway, next slide. If you're new to uh, the way we do messages here, you have an option if you'd like in your, in your notes. You can fill in, uh, you have blanks and you use the blue as your fill-ins. So the disciples, what are the ABCs of the disciples? They act wayward and they take an account of which of them will be the greatest. I once was telling some friends what I thought the Lord was calling me to, and one of them said, you think you're something, don't you? I said, did you hear what I said? I said, the Lord told me, come with me. I am going to show you what great and mighty things you will suffer for my name. It's not about me. Yes, I'm getting myself out of the way, because you, all you see is a guy doing stuff. Trust me, if it wasn't for the Lord working in me, none of this would be happening. Okay, now, Jesus says, you guys are thinking about this all wrong. Redemption and discipleship do not give you the rights of an authoritative superior benefactor. Like I'm a donor, big donor to a politician. Yo, man, I gave you money, now you got to do this for me. No. A benefactor is one who is honored for conducting service or giving something. No, he says, you're going to be a servant. You don't take the gifts that I've given you and do your thing with them or mistreat people with them. You have to say, not my will, but thy will be done. Yet because the disciples will learn to rebound and bounce back from their failures and will stick it out with Jesus. The 12 disciples, Judas is going to go, but Paul is going to get anointed. Paul, you know what an apostle is? It's a person who had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul, he gets knocked off his horse. The Lord comes and visits him several times uh, throughout the New Testament we read. And he has personal encounters with Jesus Christ. I'm not an apostle because I don't have a, in that sense, because I don't have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. So Paul replaces Judas. And what these people did is they literally learned and they bridged the gap between the old covenant and the new covenant. And they actually worked with the Holy, through the Holy Spirit's power. The Holy Spirit used them to write the, what we call the New Testament. Now, if you want to know where, where, where this is going to happen, you can look in Revelation 4.4 4 and 10, Revelation 5.8, Revelation 11.16, and Revelation 19.4. It talks about the 24 elders. Jesus said, told them, you will be crowned to judge the tribes of Israel. I believe there's the reason there's 24. We've got 12 for the New Testament. We're going to have 12 for the Old Testament. The other night I was sitting there trying to count, would Moses be one of them? Maybe, I don't know if Gideon would make it because he kind of screwed up at the end. And I'm like, I, I'll find out when I get there. Will Enoch make it? Enoch walked with God and then he was not because God took him. Will Noah be one of those 24 judges? Anyway. So, uh, and it's interesting because the 24 elders in Revelation uh, 4.10, they take their crowns and they lay them before the throne, um, you know, worshiping God. But you can read those scriptures yourself. All right, what are the ABCs of Judas jumping ship? Did you get your fill-ins? Next one, next slide. What are the ABCs of Judah, Judas jumping ship? Do you know three Gospels in, uh, in, in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John 12, they all record that Jesus was in Bethany and he gets anointed for burial. Mary comes in, Martha rather, one of the, one of, I think it was a Mary. Mary, because everybody's named Mary and Martha in the Bible, it seems. But anyway, Mary comes in and she breaks this expensive alabaster box and this tremendously expensive, a year's worth of wages, they said it probably cost. And she pours it over Jesus' feet. The Holy Spirit has motivated her to anoint Christ for burial. And Judas leads the charge, complaining. This, this could have been better spent. We should have spent it on the poor. Now, in John chapter 12, it literally says that Judas was a thief. And he used to help himself to the offering box. He didn't care about the poor. He wanted that money for himself. 
See, Judas disagreed with Christ as to how to handle money. And when he sees a year's wages being wasted, this is the final straw for him. He's like, I've been working with this Jesus guy. He's just not going to get it. I'm sick of it. Satan enters into him and he goes and makes a bad deal to turn the Lord in. So, John 12, 1 through 8 tells us that, Ju that Judas was a thief. And, uh, and uh, he complains and other people start complaining with him. And the Lord says, leave her alone. She's anointed me for burial. I tell you this, wherever the gospel is preached, what she has done for me will be acknowledged. Do you know that scoundrels always come to power by pretending they're going to care for the poor? Every dictator on the face of the earth controls his country by saying, I'm here to take care of the little guy. They beat up on all the real people who help little guys get jobs. They call you evil corporations. Do you know that capitalism is in the parable of the talents? Right? Because everybody who Jesus commended in the parable of talents, they made or traded to make money. Those are capitalistic terms. And the, because of separation of church and state, we read our Bibles through that paradigm and we follow the government now the church has become the government the, become the tail wagged by the government dog and the, and the people who are controlling our government in an evil way they say we're here for the poor so all the churches now are focused on opening food kitchens while we're letting go of the biblical basis that God gave for the foundation of our nation now, I'm not saying you should not do that but don't do it in, extent, in, in, in absence of the other because what the poor needs is for someone who can make and trade because the more I make, the more I trade, the more people I need to hire to keep helping me making and trading. Everybody gets rich together. All right. So, Judas acquiesces and he becomes an accomplice to Satan. My will for God. How many, how many, how many you, you know, how, if you don't read the Bible, you really don't know what the Bible says. You don't know what God's will is. I meet so, so many people. Well, I, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And then they claim that they're doing God's will. And I'm like, well, do you know what the Bible says about that? They don't know. God has given us the, the, the what he wants us to know about himself is revealed in scripture. So if you, if you're saying I'm going to serve God and you are not a studier of his word, you may not be serving God. Because a lot of people think they're serving the Lord. I have so many people say to me, but there's separation of church and state. And I say, show me that in the Bible. If God was going to separate himself from the state, when Pharaoh led his state to disobey God, God would have said, well, it's your state and I'm separate from it. Go do what you want to do. No, he drowned his army in the sea. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, Sorry, king, God tells me to worship this way. You want me to worship a statue of you as if it's God. God wouldn't have motivated Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to do that. And then when they are in the fire, the Lord himself shows up in the fire to protect them. Well, if there was separation of church and state, God would have said, well, you know, guys, you're supposed to obey the state and I have nothing to do with it. So just go in the fire. I hope you'll be. I'll see you on the other side of heaven. If there was separation of church and state, when Esther realized that they were going to try to kill all the Jews in the land, she wouldn't have gone to the king because there's separation of church and state. God is going to help me do that. You know, America was founded on the application of biblical values to the state. But anyway, Judas acquiesces and he becomes an accomplice of Satan. He conspires with the, with the politically appointed religious crowd, the park or the pair, the politically appointed religious establishment. Who had a deal, by the way, with the Roman government? Herod, build us a temple. And we'll get the people to do a few religious things. And our, our job is we'll keep them in line for you. That's why they did not want to sacrifice, arrest Christ during this festive Passover time. Next slide. Who are these politically appointed religious people? Who's the religious establishment? Who is the politically appointed religious establishment? What are they like? Well, number one, they did not approve of Jesus Christ's ministry. They, they, they said he was a blasphemer when he told them that he was the son of God. And they considered that a, a corporal punishment. You, you, you say that you are God and we're going to punish you by death. Now, what's the challenge with that? 
Well, I can't remember which Roman emperor was assigned to Judea. But at one point, the Roman government told the scribes and the Pharisees, the politically appointed religious crowd, you can no longer kill people. That's our, we're, we're the, if you got somebody who's done something wrong, you bring them to us and we'll kill them for you. Now, they looked at a scripture that we're going, when we go back to Genesis, we're going to get to Genesis 49, and we're going to see a scripture where Jacob prophesies over Judah and says, the scepter will not leave Judah until the Messiah comes. And when the Roman government told the politically appointed religious crowd, you have lost the ability to capital punish people, they literally paraded through the streets of Jerusalem and mourned. And they said, prophecy has not been fulfilled because we have lost the scepter and the Messiah has not come. Unbeknownst to them, in a slum called Nazareth was a little boy running through the streets. Deuteronomy 19, oh, and you know, they wanted to bury Christ so badly, they didn't care if they broke their own laws to do it. Good process leads to good outcomes. Bad process is always going to lead to a bad outcome. Doing the right thing in the wrong way becomes the wrong thing. So in Deuteronomy 19.6, um, 1916, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 1916 through 21, it says, if a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, I'm not going to read all the verses, but it basically says you do an investigation, and whatever the witness was trying to get the, the accused, whatever the witness, whatever punishment the witness was trying to bring to the, the accused, you do that to the false witness. And they had false witnesses. They arrested Christ at night. Against, it's against the law. You're supposed to have a public trial. Jesus should have been able to go to a refuge city, at least, where, where, where he could have been held in, uh, in, in protective custody for a, a proper investigation. But also, know this. These guys want to kill anybody who says, I'm God. And Jesus did not back down from that. He said, I'm God. Before Abraham was, I am. They knew exactly what he was saying. And, when they picked, he, and he knew that under, under what you people are operating under, you should try to stone me. So, but they didn't want to crucify him during the Passover because of their deal with the Roman government. See, during this festive time, the vicinity of Jerusalem would probably swell to over a million people in population because they got to come and make all these sacrifices. And there are a lot of converts too. Herod's wife was a convert, by the way. When Paul writes one of his letters, at the end of the letter, he goes, the people in so-and-so's household, they greet you. That means all the servants were getting saved. Of course, you know, many of them. Some of them. Now, their agreement, the politically appointed religious crowd or establishment had an agreement with the government. During this festival time, we want no trouble. I'm going to be bringing all my important friends into town. Herod's got a villa there. Uh, all, all, the, all the governors and the rulers uh, that were in the Roman chain of command, they all had villas there. And, so, and they all didn't get along with each other all the time. We're going to see later uh, in Scripture how Herod and, um, I'm trying to think of the other person's name, become friends over this whole, this whole challenge they have over what to do about Jesus. Pilate, Herod and Pilate. One of them realizes, well, he's from that territory. I can wash my hands of this and ships it off to the other guy. And the other guy's wife says, I had a bad dream. Do not mess with that man. He's an innocent man. Anyway, so their agreement was during this festival time called this festive time called the Passover. We want no trouble. And so their, their goal is to keep the people in line. Now, if you're a religious zealot and you go through the Passover rituals, you probably, at that point, probably are feeling more empowered to overthrow the wickedness than at other times. So it's a very challenging balancing act for the politically appointed religious crowd. But what does Jesus do? He, if you read the, the, the four Gospels, comes into Jerusalem, he sees the money changers at the temple. He goes back out to spend the night in Bethany, gets anointed for his burial, and the next day he's sitting there fashioning, he goes and buys all this stuff, and he's sitting there fashioning a, 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 a cat of nine tails. And the disciples are, what are you doing? He goes, just wait right here. And he goes over and kicks the place apart. You're making my dad's house, my father's house, a den of thieves. You mess with an evil person's money, and they will kill you. And what Jesus literally was doing, 
Pilate and Herod and those guys, they estimate during this festival time, there's so much money going through that temple, I better get my taxes. And Jesus literally insinuated himself between the people that were being ripped off and the Roman government. He said, not on my shift. And they, because he has to be crucified during the Passover. And they got the message. I'll be back tomorrow. You, 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 you try it again. So what, if you were one of the politically appointed religious crowd, you're like, wow, this dude's going to get me in trouble with the government. So I got to get him tonight. He's, Jesus is controlling the time of his departure because he is the Passover. Christ our Passover, sacrifice for us. Anyway, what about Peter? Let's go on to Peter. We saw Peter deny Christ three times. What are the ABCs of uh, what's going on in Peter's life? Well, Peter pledges allegiance and denies that he will deny Christ. You know, it's easy to die for God. Somebody comes in this room and says, if you're a Christian, stand against the wall, I'm going to shoot you. I'm like, well, hit, here, here, hit right here. Let's get this over with. It's challenging to live for God under persecution. We saw that in the Paul movie on Friday. Peter boasts that Christ is wrong about him. You read those scriptures and you say, well, I'm not like that. I hope I'm, I, I, I now read the Bible and I go, God, please work in me so I don't do that. Because left to my own devices, I'm going to do that. <laughs> when I was a young Christian, I would think, well, you know, I lift weights, I jog, I can live for God in my own strength. Peter overestimates his ability to be consistent and his commitment in the face of satanic sifting. Right? Jesus said, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. You know what that word means? Sift you like wheat? It means he's going to, he's got permission from God to cause some inward agitation that will try your faith to the very fur verge of overthrowing it. Luke 22, 30. Do you think Jesus would have talked about a literal Satan if there wasn't one? All right. Luke twenty two thirty one. Simon, Simon, behold, demand, uh, Satan demanded to have you. Remember in the book of Job, uh, the angels come before God and Satan comes also. And God says to Satan, the first time I read this, I'm like, no. <laughs> and God says to Satan, hey, have you noticed my servant Job? And I'm like, don't point him out to the guy. This is going to be bad. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and so and Satan says, well, of course he serves you. You give him stuff. Take his stuff. He'll curse you to your face. And God gives Satan permission to do some things to Job. Well, apparently, God gave, P God gave Satan permission. Why did he do that? Because just like God was wrestling with Jacob in the Old Testament, not to hurt Jacob, he touched Jacob and ripped his, his hip out of socket. He was only wrestling with Jacob to exhaust him, to bring him to the end of yourself. And all of us have had that, many of us have had that spiritual punch in the gut. That huge failure. And you're like, I'm not getting out of bed again. If this is what I am like, I am not going to try. I can't put people through this again. And the Holy Spirit says, get out of bed. Because right now, the only person that has victory is, is the devil over this. You get up. You dust yourself off. You trust my word. My blood on that cross is more durable than your puny sin. He's not jumping down from the cross and going, Woo, you blew it off me. <laughs> Woo, I just undied for you. No. All right. But Peter, he follows from afar. J. Vernon McGee, that's my JVM. J. Vernon McGee says, following Jesus from afar is not a very good thing to do because you're lacking the power, you're lacking the relationship, you're sort of left to your own devices. It's not going to be effective. You got to follow closer. Well, anyway, Peter has this great failure, but he remembers. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will bring to remembrance what I said. Peter responds to the Holy Spirit. He remembers and he gets up to obey. Later, when Jesus is resurrected and uh, the, the disciples are out fishing and Jesus is on the shore with fish and, he's got, and, and the fire is going, and P Peter recognizes who it is. And instead of sinking, shri shrinking to the back of the boat, kind of pulling his robe up around himself because he doesn't want to be seen, he jumps in the water and swims to his Lord because he's got to get some things right with his God. And his God says, Peter, do you love me? And he goes, yes. 
Peter denied him three times. Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And Peter says, you know I love you. And he goes, let's quit wallowing. He went back to fishing. I didn't tell you to go back to fishing. Go get yourself to Jerusalem in that upper room and you wait for my Holy Spirit's power. Feed my sheep. Do you hear what God is saying to us? Stop retreating into your negative self-image, into, into the shadows of guilt. Come out of there. Jesus opens the closet. Hey, remember the story of the Christmas movie where the kid wants the Red Rider BB gun and the boy has the fight and the, and, the, and the mother goes and rescues him and the kid was saying all sorts of terrible things as he was fighting with the other kid and the little brother says, Daddy's going to come home and kill Ralphie. And the little boy climbs under the, crawls under the sink in a cabinet and the mother opens the door and what are you doing in there? He goes, Daddy's going to kill Ralphie. And the mother goes, no, he's not. Yeah, he is. And she goes, well, you want to stay in there? You know, for, yes, I want to stay in here. And then she goes and gets some milk and opens the door and gives him some milk. So the father comes home. She opens the door, tells the kid, get up to the table. And the, the dad goes, well, what happened today? And the mother says, oh, nothing. Ralphie just had a little fight. A fight? And Ralphie's like, I can see my eyes flashing before my, my life flashing before my eyes. And, and the mother doesn't tell on him because the debt's been paid. There's another part of the movie where he says something bad and the debt gets paid with soap in his mouth. <laughs> But that's like Peter. He knows he's screwed up. God does not kick us when he's down. What's that Bible verse? A bruised reed he will not blow out. A, smolder, a bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering flax he will not snuff out. He gently blows on the embers. Am, uh, what do you call it? Ember, embers? And he gets the fire going. I'm, I know. I know that we are pathetic. I know that when we look in the mirror at times, we're like, gosh, this, this, is, uh, this is terrible, Lord, that you're relying upon me. Now, I'm not going to say that's all God has got, but it's all what he chooses to use. Get over yourself and get into the Lord. All right? So, let's talk about... Um, well, I, wanna, I just want to point out one thing in Luke... 2232 Jesus advises Peter and he actually commands him. He says, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. I've read that for the first time when I was a young Christian. I said, when you have turned again, I got to keep turning. I got to get up when I'm down. All right. Why is Jesus going to the cross? Let's look at the ABCs of Jesus in Gethsemane. You know, sometimes we look at these scriptures and I'm like, oh, I start seeing a bunch of A's and a bunch of B's and a bunch of C's. And I'm like, okay, I'll organize the, the thing that way. But over time, I realize, well, we're not going to do the ABCs of, of the different events. We'll do the ABCs of the people who are, who are, who are the, the focus of the events. There's a lot of ways to organize this. You can get like 100 sermons out of any scripture, you know. Anyway, so Jesus bears a tremendous burden as he wrestles with God in the garden. Jesus asked if it's God's will, remove this cup of suffering. I learned from that. There are times when I say, Lord, do I have to go through this? And he goes, well, you know what you're like? Yeah. <laughs> An angel comes and strengthens him in his extreme agony about what he humanly will face once he is arrested in the garden. We saw him in the upper room bless the bread and the wine. And now we're going to see him pour out his blood to bear our sins. He is literally going to become our Passover. As the death angel saw the blood in Exodus and passed over those who, who, who participated in God's salvation plan. The Bible says in Exodus, you stand in your doorway and you take a, a, a bowl of lamb's blood and you put it between your feet. You take a hyssop branch and you dip it in that blood and you strike the top of your doorpost and then you strike it on either side. You make a cross with that blood and my angel is going to see the cross. He's going to see the blood and he will pass over you. My death angel will pass over you. And Jesus is now 
pushing the envelope, controlling the time of his awful departure. And he, and he bleeds huge drops of blood because he's under such human stress. He is fully man. He is very, very man. And he is very, very God. Because he is very, very man, if, if he stubs his toe, it hurts like we stub our toe. Because he is very, very man. You put a crown of thorns on his head. Prick your finger. Multiply it by 10,000. Because he is very, very God, he can tolerate it. Jesus cares for his disciples and he ensures that none of them is harmed. And he completely commits to God's will when the answer to whether or not he can win our salvation any other way comes. He realizes he has to drink the most tremendous cup of suffering the world will ever know. We had a message when we went through the book of Luke about how God delivered us in darkness. So awful must it have been for God to reach back into Genesis and to sweep the sins onto Christ and to reach forward into Revelation and sweep the sins upon Christ. So awful must it have been that he darkened the world so nobody could see it. The horror of that. Well, what does it do for us? Next slide. The ABCs of God's provision of the crucifixion that makes it possible for him to have fellowship with sinners like us. Christ accomplished once for all the atonement of sins by fulfilling scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake, he, meaning God, made him, meaning Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. I know if you look at your life, you don't feel so righteous at times. But the more you relate to God's will for your life, the more you will, under, you will, you will be able to walk in that righteousness. The more you wallow in self-pity and retreat into the shadows of doubt and fear and guilt, you're not going to get there. You've got to take God in His word. He did not die for nothing. He died so that not my will, but thy will can be done. The Holy Spirit can work on us. Hebrews 11.28, by faith, he, meaning Moses, kept the Passover and the application of the blood. He applied the blood. They applied the blood to their doorpost so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. People say, well, God would never send anybody to hell. I'm like, go read, go read Exodus. Well, we're, we're, God, God, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Therefore, God would never have had a Christian nation. I'm like, well, okay. What you see in America is what happened in Exodus. Pharaoh said, Pharaoh said the same thing. He did not bow his nation to God. Look what happened to his nation. We partake of the application through belief. John 2.22, when therefore he was raised from the dead, or 22.22, or 20.22, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The cup that Christ drank, it cleansed us. It made it possible for us to be declared righteous, so the Holy Spirit actually can dwell in us. 1 Peter 2.24 says this, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. How do wayward people get right with God? Well, we turn, we believe in salvation, we receive Christ, the Holy Spirit enters into us and begins to clean up our act, motivate us from the inside out.